you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for this morning for our devotion um, is found in Revelation chapter 3, and we'll be looking at the first six verses. Uh, these verses are also included in your, in your bulletin here if you'd like to follow along. To the angel of the church of Sardis, in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Congregation may be seated. Dear Christian friends, I once saw a bumper sticker that said, Jesus is coming. Look busy. Thought it was funny, but it actually reveals a very common misconception. You see, many people confuse busyness with faith. While faith will urge us to be busy, of course, with the Lord's work, busyness isn't the same as faith. You see, one can be exceedingly busy with the work of the church and not think about Jesus at all. One can fill his mind and days with God's work and yet still experience no love for either God or his people. You know what happens to God's workers a lot? There is so much to do in the Lord's work and the, that there is no time left to connect with God. So many meetings, so many tasks, so many people, so little time. We can expend so much, expend so much energy and exhaust ourselves to the point that we don't think about the one for whom we work anymore. And we die a little inside every time we look at the next round of work that demands our days. This gives a little summary of the church in Sardis. In the fifth of seven letters, Jesus speaks to a church that has much action, but little faith. It's a busy church, but dead and empty on the inside. In verse one we read, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. You'll notice that Jesus starts every letter with the phrase, these are the words. With this phrase, Jesus stresses how important his word is. This church needs his word. They don't need miracles or success or more things to do. They simply need his word. You see, God's word is paramount. His word gives life. His word creates faith. His word provides the assurance of our forgiveness and opens the gates of heaven for us. God's word is the solution for every church and every Christian. Jesus' description of himself reminds us back to the first letter that he wrote, the one to the church in Ephesus in chapter 2. The seven spirits of God there refer to the Holy Spirit, the deliverer and sustainer of the covenant. The Holy Spirit dictated the words of the Bible to its writers. The message, the message is the message of Jesus Christ, who was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament, and who fulfilled these prophecies, prophecies and died in our place on the cross. To this day, the Holy Spirit labors to bring sinners to their Savior. The Spirit is sent by Jesus, going out to the Father, to testify about Him. And then there are the seven stars. Those seven stars refer to the pastors of those churches. The image of Jesus holding the seven stars reminds us that the future and the fate of the ministry is in his
his hand. So when he admonishes this church, he also holds their healing and their hope. Verse 1 continues, I know your deeds, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. As he does in each of these seven letters, Jesus starts with the words, I know. Jesus knows this church and loves them, but he also knows what's really going on. They may have everyone else fooled, maybe even themselves, but they haven't fooled Jesus. They have the reputation of a church that was alive, a church that was busy with God's work, carrying out their ministry with energy and with spirit. You see, the church in Sardis had a great reputation. They were seen as a church filled with the spirit and filled with life. But that's only how it looked on the outside. The reputation was held among people who could not see their hearts. Jesus knows. He could see, the pat, he could see past the events and the flurry of activity and the jam-packed calendars they had because he knows really where the heart is. They were dead. They managed to create an illusion of life to the community around them. But it was not man's judgment that mattered. It was not man whom they were supposed to be serving. Yes, the church at Sardis was supposed to be serving God. And in God's judgment, they were dead. They weren't really serving God. You see, they were really serving themselves. Yes, they were doing God's work. That's how they got their reputation. But they were doing it for themselves. Not out of faith, or out of love for their Lord. This is the kind of church where people are overloaded with work, but are constantly fighting with each other. Each group is trying to justify its own importance instead of, instead of seeking to serve their neighbors and their Lord. It's a church whose first priority is to fund the budget for another year. Instead of seeking how God seeking seeking how God's will and how they can best carry it out. It's a church that's so busy with itself that it no longer notices the dying souls around it. Yes, Sardis was a church that was dead. And they didn't even know it. So Jesus commands them in verse 2, Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. You know, the most amazing feature of this command is that God still loved the church at Sardis. These people had marginalized him in favor of activities and events. But you know what? He still loves them. Remember that. When your faith feels weak and activity has pushed God out of your life, God still loves you. He commands you to wake up and bring your faith back to life and health. You can look back at the verse here. Verse 2 has two parts in its command. The first you see is, wake up. The church at Sardis needed to recognize their fatal disease. They needed to become aware of their desperate need to repent and return to their Savior. Not all the programs, not all the glitz, not all the approbation of the world could save them. All the things that they have, that they have been striving for and su succeeded to obtain, their status, their reputation in the city and among their people, none of those things could save them. Only Jesus could save them. Only by faith, not by works, not by acclamation. So they needed to, and the second command is, strengthen what remained and was about to die. What did remain in the church of Sardis? There were shreds of faith then clinging to tattered souls still left in that church. They needed to reconnect to Jesus. They needed to remember that everything they did they didn't do for themselves, they did for Him. Everything they did had the sole purpose of connecting people to their Savior. You know, there was such a focus on the things they were doing, and they received so much credit for doing it well, that they had forgotten why they were doing it, or for whom. The activities had been, become important in itself, Holding church services became important for the sake of the church services. Bible classes were held so that we could have, they could have more and bigger Bible classes. 
The purpose of the school changed from training young Christians into getting the school to grow. You know, that impresses the neighbors, doesn't it? It makes the church seem alive and strong. But Jesus tells them he wants the church to wake up and to lift their eyes to heaven. You see, living faith serves Jesus in everything it does. Faith lives and loves in big and small things, whether anyone is looking or not. Consider this for a minute. Consider the difference between a child gathering daisies for her mom and the child cleaning his room so that he can borrow the car. Which one of those is motivated by love? Which one is really serving only himself? Yes, God wants his people to do everything out of love and by faith. You see, the fact of the matter is that anything that doesn't come from faith is actually sin. It doesn't matter how often you come to church. It matters why you come to church. It doesn't matter how much you give. It matters why you are giving it. It doesn't matter how many people are impressed with you or how few. But what, what matters is your relationship with God, strengthening your faith and your love. You see, by faith, the small things, they're alive and they're precious. Without faith, there's something missing. So Jesus tells them that your deeds are incomplete. They are empty of love for their Savior. They are really serving themselves instead of God. Paul continues now, looking at the solution. So what is the solution to the church except for the church at Sardis? First three says, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. The answer, the cure, that's God's word. Remember what you have received and heard. We have the incredible gifts of God's own words, written specifically for you and I. Listen again to the words of Scripture. Hear again the voice of your loving God. You see, His word is life. How long has it been since you've paid attention to it? Since you have looked for how God wants you to change your life? You know, as Jesus says here, obey it and repent. The natural reaction of our dead, sinful nature is, is to listen to God's word for validation. You see, we want a reason to excuse our sinful lives and to avoid having to change anything in it. The natural response of faith is to submit to God's word and to change our sinful life. Maybe it's a little thing, like not using words that dishonor God, or looking for a way to brighten our spouse's day instead of trying to brighten our own. Or it could be a big change, like turning off the TV to commit to a ministry, or maybe taking one night a week to visit the sick or the shut-in. Not in some hope of reward, or not in some hope of looking good, but it's because that's what Jesus wants us to do. Remember what you have received. Remember both who you are and whose you are. Listen to the Word of God. Obey it and repent. Yes, this church in Sardis was on its deathbed. But by the power of the word, they could be saved. Verse 3 continues, But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. You know, the biggest obstacle to waking up God's people is convincing them that it's important. Satan has been very successful with convincing us that, rec rec that reputation, recreation, and relaxation are the main things in life. He works very hard at keeping us asleep and blind to the fact that we are only passing through this world and will spend our eternity elsewhere. When Jesus says that he will come like a thief if they don't wake up, it means that they will not be ready for him when he comes. You know, we don't know how long we have until Judgment Day. We don't know how much time we have to return to God and his word. But it's not okay to delude yourselves. It's not okay to be apathetic toward God. You see, Jesus is coming, and now is the only time we have to learn His Word and prepare for His return. Verse 4 tells us, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not 
swords thrown on their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. Yes, there were still some in Sardis who lived by their faith. They had not fallen into serving themselves or becoming so much like the pagan culture surrounding them that there was no longer any discernible difference between them. Yes, these faithful few had lived their faith. You see, it wasn't the busyness that enamored them. It was their Savior. It wasn't the approval of the crowd that they craved. Instead, they just wanted to walk with God. Their clothes were white, and they were provided by Jesus. You know what white stands for. It stands for righteousness, doesn't it? They walked with Jesus in his righteousness. Those clothes are rare. They only come from one place, the cross. And think of how expensive they were. They were paid for with the blood of God himself. Think for a moment then about how God sees his faithful people. He calls them worthy. So what would you rather have? Having all your friends and neighbors impressed with you? Or having God pleased with you? And what's going to matter on Judgment Day? Yes, it's that important. Verse 5 says, he who, over, he who overcomes will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. The promise Jesus gives to the half-dead in that in the church is the same as the promise for those who have remained faithful. Everything you and I need is provided by God. You see, it's not our works or our busyness that brings us into his favor. It's his son. We do not overcome by working hard or getting busy. We, are, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Our future and our judgment is in Jesus' hands. The white clothes come from him. Our name in the book of life comes from him. He stands up for us on judgment day. And in Jesus, we have nothing to fear, either here or in eternity. And verse 6 continues, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The most important use of your ear is to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Read God's Word. Read the Bible. Attend church. And pay attention while you still have the chance. His word and the sacraments are what wake us up and strengthen us. You see, Jesus is the only one who can give us a white robe and provide us a home in heaven. So let's wake up together and pursue God and his word together. You see, he will fill the emptiness in our lives and he will walk with us all the way to the gates of heaven, our home. God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.